Hi everybody, it's Adam from Lucid Pixel. Now before I get started, I wanted to extend a huge thank you. Over the last little while, I've received some extremely heartwarming emails from people completely going out of their way to thank me and give me, you know, and, and encourage me to keep making these art talks and to let me know that, that my art talks have really been having a profound impact on them, personally and professionally. And I want to let you know that your emails, your messages, your Facebook messages, your YouTube comments have been so incredibly encouraging to me and reassuring that I'm actually making a difference for you guys. So to you, I extend my very warm and sincere thank you in return. Now with that said, this art talk has a lot to do with this, with your confidence in this industry. And I'm gonna put a very strong bracket on the word industry of art as it exists today. Now, if you've watched a lot of TED Talks and conferences and a lot, listened to a lot of people and experts on the subject of education in the last five, 10 years, especially in the last five years, you'll notice that a lot of people are coming out now strongly questioning the state of education because as we know it, as it's being expressed more and more, the education system as it exists today was designed back in the mid to late 19th century to essentially feed the industrial era. When the world started to become industrialized, they needed to produce very robotic, repetitive, high efficiency, workers that could handle long hours of repetitive work. Now, over those years, there are certain industries that fit naturally into that factory work, you know, car manufacturing, engineering to a certain degree, you know, uh, programming can fit into that, uh, accountancy can fit into that, all of these different, all of these industries that require a person to take advantage of their existing acquired knowledge. Okay, so people would spend time, they would educate themselves intensely to acquire a huge body of knowledge to become incredibly, incredibly uh, 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 smart in certain subjects to the point where they could do it very efficiently and quickly. So in that respect, those particular types of jobs fit perfectly into that type of, that type of uh, 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 revolution, an industrial revolution. However, not art. And to a certain degree, Art up until, I'd say up until probably, I, I don't quote me on this because I was born in 75, but I'd say until maybe the 70s or 80s, okay? Uh, I'm kind of, I'm kind of uh, uh, quoting my mother here because she was, she was a part of that whole, that whole, uh, 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 that whole revolution artistically during, the, at the time. Up until artwork started to become digitized, where 3D graphics and 2D graphics started to become a thing where computers could start doing artistic jobs, up until then, Artists were kind of immune from that type of industry because it was understood that artists didn't produce, pump out, factory speed work. People produced artwork. It was, people understood that artwork required a lot of focus in the moment, a lot of emotional and, and physical and mental energy. It required uh, a lot of taking breaks, analyzing work from a distance, going back over it. It required a lot of experimentation. It lot, required a lot of thinking in the moment. It burned a lot more calories. You couldn't produce artwork robotically. Sure, there's certain skills that you become good at and your you know, hand-to-eye coordination, all those different types of things and how you analyze things, sure. And there's definitely a structure. There's the fundamental structure of art, which of course I teach, right? But um, it didn't quite fall into that category. But as soon as things started to become digital and art became a lot more accessible, the ability to produce and transport art became a lot easier the artistic industry started to transform as well. And what was expected of artists start to transform as well. Now, I mentioned my mother before. My mother, who I've mentioned in other art talks in the past, and who I actually had a conversation with before we had this art talk, I'm actually glad we did because she kind of gave me a good full perspective. She kind of gave me a, a different perspective on it that helped me give me a better, a better two-sided view of this coin. Um, but she, I was raised by a fine artist, an oil painter. Okay. Well, originally a fine artist who ended up studying computer science and ended up being one of the first people on earth, if not the first person, no, one of the first people, I'll have to ask her about this, to produce computer graphics. Go figure. Go Duff family, right? And uh, as such, she started off as a fine artist with all the struggles that come with being a fine artist, right? And ended up learning computer graphics and then as such, because she was one of the only people that, that understood com both computer graphic, uh, computer science and art produced computer graphics. And once that happened, a little spark went off in the industry. And all of a sudden employers start to say, hey, 
if we can get this kind of efficiency out of artists, we can start we can start producing artwork on more of an industrial level. We can start producing artwork at a much higher volume. We can demand it, demand more of artists because we know that they can produce it and deliver it quick more quickly. So a lot of these businesses, a lot of these industries, a lot of these entrepreneurs who started these businesses decided to start finding ways of exploiting artists the same way they exploited everybody else, fitting artists into the same industrial mold, high, and this word makes me want to gag, makes me want to throw up every time, high output from artists. <laughs> Mwah. <laughs> makes my skin crawl to hear that. But you get my point, okay? Artists that can produce high out, a high output of art. So um, what this did is it created an invisible fracture right down the middle of the industry, something that I, I managed to witness because when I first started working digitally, I started, when I started working in the, in the industry, my first, first jobs were working traditionally, paper, pencil, and the only, the most technical thing we had was a scanner. We had a scanner, you know, we scanned our drawings and, you know, colored it in the, the most pathetic excuse for Photoshop you've ever seen, really early, early versions of Photoshop with flat colors, right? So everything was still done traditionally to a certain extent. But then quickly, you know, uh, you know, drawing tablets started to become a thing and we started to be able to produce art directly into the computer and so on and so forth. And all of a sudden I started to see certain things appear and surface and I started to see mentalities change in the industry where all of a sudden people were starting to show off things like speed painting and speed art and people were starting to post, you know, 40, the, the time it took for them to produce a piece of artwork. When up until that point, Nobody gave a shit. You know, who cares how long it took you? Artists were expected to take as long as it took for them to produce the artwork it took them to produce it. You hired that artist because you you were a fan of their particular style and it took them a certain amount of time to produce it. You paid them what they, were, what they asked for and that was the end of it. Or you didn't pay them because you couldn't afford them. But artists were very respected for the time it took for them to produce a piece of artwork. That wasn't something that was questioned. Now it is, okay? Now, before I move forward, I want a little disclaimer. I'm not hating on efficiency. I'm not hating on digital art. I do it for a living, right? And, and to me, efficiency does play a very important role in how I produce artwork, but I take it from a certain specific angle that I want to share with you as well today, okay? So just, I just want you to recognize this difference. And I also, that, 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 that split, that divide, that, I, that, that invisible... Uh, you know, uh, fracture that I saw through the industry was reflected in my friends, my peers, my fellow artists. There were artists, friends of mine who were naturally efficient people. They were fast. They could produce artwork very quickly. They could they could very quickly come up with a uh, with a with a, uh, a functional formula to produce art so that their employer could say that's satisfactory. Move forward. Keep going. And they made their employers happy. They got hired because they, you know, the portfolio reflected the, the, the formula that these studios were looking for. Other artists who up until that point had been regarded as some of the most genius, some of the most skilled, some of the most unique, some of the most fabulous artists out there, all of a sudden started to struggle to find art, struggle to find work. They started to find themselves not getting their phone, their their calls returned. They weren't getting any good jobs. They were struggling to pay the bills. They were they were finding themselves doing other work just to just to make ends meet, right? All of a sudden, they were unwanted. All, but up until that point, they were the they were the stars, and these stars all of a sudden started to become started to become the losers. And I'm like sitting there going, how the hell did that happen? I mean, look at the skill of this artist versus that artist. How could that artist get hired over this one? And a lot of artists, including myself, were sitting there scratching their heads going, where the hell did I go wrong? And a couple of years, when a couple, when, you know, a couple of years or a couple of decades start to accumulate and you're still struggling and you're still not fitting into this niche art world, you start to highly question your skills and it starts to become a personal thing where you start to think to yourself, fuck, maybe I just don't cut it. Maybe I'm just not good enough. Maybe I'm just, maybe... I followed the wrong industry. Maybe I should maybe I should have done something else. Instead, what I'm saying, what I've learned, and it took me a long time to realize this, is that there are two types of people that work in this industry. Again, I'm putting emphasis on the word industry. 
Artwork was industrialized. Naturally, who adapts to an industrial type mentality? Although this, this in industrial type mentality is starting to fade away, okay? So what I'm saying now, there's, I'm not saying this with a sense of permanence. I'm not saying this is, this is permanently how it's gonna be. I'm saying this is how it is today in 2016, okay? Artists that naturally adapt to this very repetitive factory type work do great because they're capable of creating a formula that they can forget and just repeat, 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 repeat. This is fabulous for employment. It's a fabulous skill for people to have. And those people in, in who you know, run schools, that people who, who, who teach their method, it's a very valuable skill to teach and it's a very valuable skill to learn because it's creating, it's creating artists, it's helping to teach artists the skills that they need in order to produce art on a regular basis. But some artists aren't designed that way. And some artists are designed to produce art, okay? Some artists are designed to produce slowly, thoughtfully, originally. They're the ones who, who are visionaries. They're the ones who are slow. They're the ones who are perfectionists. They're the ones who, who you know, don't, they, don't, they, they, they don't have high output. They, they don't do paintings in 45 minutes. Maybe they'll do it in three weeks. Maybe they'll do it in a month. Maybe they'll do it in five days. But they take their time with a project. And, but when they do finish their project, you cannot hold their artwork up to anybody else's and say, yeah, it looks like so-and-so. Their artwork is entirely unique. And that, up until the 1960s, 70s, 80s, please, if you're, if you're an artist who's, who's over 40 years old, then please let me know when this whole thing really started to transform. But um, art, where these artists were the ones that were celebrated. These ones were the ones that were successes. And usually, in most cases, these artists were traditional artists. They worked in oils, they worked in acrylics or inks or whatever the case might be. They didn't work digitally, right? So what we need to do and what is happening right now, thankfully, if you listen to artists like Chris Oatley or Noah Bradley or you know even Tyler or myself, any of these people that are teaching online, a lot of them are starting to shine a little bit of hate on speed painting. They're starting to say, stop looking at speed painters. You're not going to learn anything from that. It's... Nothing but, uh, it's nothing but a, a technique. It's not art. And furthermore, very thankfully, artists that are renowned and respected and celebrated and idolized for being extremely efficient designers and artistic technicians, they themselves, the heads, these, the leaders of this movement are very vocal about the fact that they are not artists and it was i had so much respect i'm not going to name names of course but I, when I, I people who i i listen to and enjoy as much as the next person right people who i who I have a lot of respect for as well and i'm, I'm sitting there listening to it and, and i would hear them s express this fact and i went yes thank you for saying that thank you for making that distinction between being a very highly skilled technician and designer versus being somebody who is an artist. There's a very strong distinction between the two. And you, in an unbiased way, need to look at yourself, like every one of us in this industry needs to do, needs to look at yourself and ask yourself, not in a black and white way, but in a, you know, weighing yourself type of way, which side of the scale you tip. Do you skip, do you, do you, are you more of somebody who's very efficient, very formulaic, somebody who can, who can produce a very high volume of art, somebody who knows how to create a very organized workflow and produce a very high volume of work, somebody who can do like three paintings a day? Or are you somebody who's more artistic, more thoughtful, slower, more experimental, somebody who takes a long time, doesn't look at the clock? You have to pick a side of that fence. Now, by as soon as you identify with that side of the fence that you belong on, you get a very clear perspective of where you fit into this industry. This is something that I had to realize for myself because I've had my struggles too, knowing what side of the fence I belonged on before I even knew that there was a side. I kind of clumped everything into one category working as an artist, right? It's not the same. There's very different, very different th thoughts. There's different, very different methodologies that go into this. Once you discover what side of the fence, what, what side of the scale you tip, it's at that point 
that you know exactly how to train yourself and how to transform yourself to make yourself more employable or make yourself more original. Because one way or another, certain artists are super efficient, but their biggest, I know I teach them, their biggest concern is how do I find my style? How do I find my uniqueness? How do I, how do I express myself? How do I add more depth to my work? At a certain point, being efficient isn't enough. Paying your bills isn't enough. You got in this for a reason because you want to express yourself in a very profound way. You want to immortalize your thoughts in a certain way. You don't want to just be, yeah, you know, uh, uh, Johnny Timbuktu over there did 400 paintings, all of which are forgettable, right? You want to produce stuff that's memorable. So that's the side you take it on. You, are, you understand that you've got technical skill. Now you have to start exploring your mind in a more artistic way. You have to start observing more. You have to start focusing more. You have to start slowing yourself down on your own time, of course, when you're not at work. Slowing yourself down and, and reframing your thought process. Try drawing with the right side of your brain a little bit more. Do a little bit more observing, more. Do, do, some, do some drawings where you're drawing without looking. Take your ego out of the equation. Take structure out of the equation and see how you can play with the abstract parts of your mind and the creative sides of your mind, so on and so forth, and help create a balance there. If you're somebody who's entirely artistic and uniqueness and style and expression, you're dripping with it. It's, you know, you exude this, this pink, you know, haze of originality in your work, but efficiency-wise, but technically speaking, having a method that is repeatable and employable, something like when you, and the same thing applies to you work in a gallery. Galleries won't hire you for one piece of work. If you're a fine artist and you do traditional art, they expect a collection of art, an exhibit of art, right? So there has to be a certain level of efficiency anyways, whether you work in the digital, you know, whether you work in concept art for film or games, or whether you work in the studio as a fine artist, you still need to be efficient to a certain degree or you'll sit and starve, you know, you don't, you don't have a choice. So, um, so how do I start to create, take on some of these abilities that I have and make them repeatable? How I use color, how I use value and find a way of, of, of uh, making your artwork a little bit more efficient within reason. Within reason enough that it doesn't, you don't sacrifice those things that you're naturally gifted at. Okay, if you listen to many of my art talks in the past, in the past, I always talk about exploiting those things which you are naturally gifted at. Don't take your natural abilities for granted just because it comes to you easy. Doesn't mean it's not an accomplishment. It means you were born to do that. So don't take that for granted. Right? Something that I had to learn in my life as well. So remember what side of the fence you are on. Remember, take a good look at yourself. If you're somebody who you find has always been praised for your art, but could never get a job, maybe that means you're more of an artist. If you're somebody that's extremely efficient, but extremely unsatisfied with what you produce, maybe you're more of a, maybe you're more of a technical designer. And if you want to strive for your balance, first you have to identify what side of the scale you are on first so that you can start to counterbalance it with other skills. All right. So hopefully this talk has inspired you. And once again, thank you to everybody who's been leaving their awesome comments. Now, I, I, I mentioned at the end of every talk, I have an online mentorship uh, and the Brush Sauce Theater. So if you're interested in joining the Brush Sauce Theater competition, uh, I believe it's you just look up Google Plus Brush Sauce Theater uh, art contest. And me and myself and Tyler Edlin uh, will critique and give you some prof professional critique on your art. It is a huge success and there are many submissions to the point where we're pretty crazy rushed when we're doing it but it's a lot of fun so you can get free critique on your stuff it doesn't cost you a penny and get some free exposure at the same time it gives you a chance to practice your art so there's that and my online mentorship uh lucid pixel which of course you can uh, you can go and check out all of that in the description below i'll leave all the links and all the information for you guys so thank you once again and take care Bye bye